Come on, we can do better than that. What's up, Bloom Church? Man, we are pumped you are here. Man, I am so excited you're here. You could be anywhere. The fact that you're here means the world to us. I hope you feel welcomed and loved today. If you're new, let me introduce myself. My name is Mike. I have the wonderful honor of being the lead pastor here. I'm so excited and blessed that I get to be here with you. But I'm also pumped and excited about everybody watching online and our family out at Forsyth. Can y'all help me welcome everybody out at Forsyth? What's up, Forsyth? Man, you looking fresh to death today. Come on, somebody. Man, I am pumped and excited. All right, guys, we're going to go right into the message today. So I need you to get them notes out right now because I'm excited about the message we're speaking today. We are in a series right now, if you don't know, called Battle Ready. We've been talking about the fact that we're in a spiritual warfare, a spiritual battle, and we got to be ready for that battle. And a lot of us don't realize that. A lot of us kind of think it's more symbolic or something that we've heard about. And so we don't really take it that seriously. And that's why in the very first week, we kicked this whole thing off and said, we live in a physical world, but we also live in a spiritual world. And the way we look at this matters because the devil likes to fight in the shadows. He likes for you to be oblivious. He likes for you to go through around thinking there's nothing spiritual going on and all your problems are physical, circumstantial problems. And so we need to understand there's a spiritual battle we're fighting. And then starting last week, we started breaking down some practical areas on how we can win the battle. Not just defend ourselves, but defeat the dude that's already been defeated and win the spiritual warfares. And so we started talking about the three areas that Satan most intensely attacks. Because there's three areas, if you read in the Bible and you start reading through scriptures and you read through spiritual warfare and you read the design that God has for you, there's three areas you're gonna find that really pop up a lot on the reg. And this is where the devil likes to attack you and get you. What we talked about last week is first, your mind. He likes to get in your thoughts. He likes for you to doubt the word of God. He likes for you to doubt that God has a plan for you and that God loves you. He wants you to get in your mind and manipulate things and twist the truth of the word of of God because if he can get you doubting, he's already won. So he wants to get in your mind. But today what we're going to talk about is this. The second part is your emotions. That he wants you passionate, but he doesn't want you passionate about God. He wants you passionate about things of this world. He wants you driven by your urges and your desires. He wants you chasing after things, but he just doesn't want you chasing after God. So he's going to try to drive your emotions and your urges and your heart so that you become passionate about everything other than God. And then lastly, we're going to cap it off next week with talking about the will. That he wants to stop your purpose. He wants to stop your destiny. He don't care if you get to heaven. He just don't want you to take people with you. He don't want you to live a purposeful life. And so he's going to come after those three things. And so today I'm going to really focus in on our heart, our emotions. Because here's what I know. God wants you passionate about being the person you're called and created to be. God wants you passionate about him. God wants you passionate about his promises and his word. But here's what I know about passion. No one can force you to be passionate. No one can make you be passionate about something. Passion has to be a choice. And if you don't have passion, you're not going to have sustainability in life. If you're not passionate about something, you're not going to be able to sustain yourself to see that thing through. And here's the thing. You can have all the head knowledge. You can be the smartest person in the world. You can know all the facts. But if you don't have passion, you won't have the resilience to push through when you need it most to see what you're desiring or what you're thinking or what you're dreaming come to reality. And this is for anything, whether you have a dream for your life and and you've got this destiny you've pictured, whether this is for your marriage, whether this is for any other human relationship, whether this is in your career or your workplace or whether this is in your relationship with God. You can have all the head knowledge in the world, but if you're not passionate about God or that thing you're chasing, you'll never see it become a reality. And we've got to get our hearts aligned with God. There's a powerful scripture in Psalms 23, verse 1, that David says it like this. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. 
And we'll sing songs about this and you'll see this on little paintings in your grandma's house, right? This scripture, the Lord is my shepherd, have all I'm gonna need. But a lot of times we don't realize how powerful and how real this scripture is. He's my shepherd. What's that mean? I follow the shepherd. The shepherd don't follow me. The shepherd is the one that leads me. The shepherd is stronger than me. The shepherd is smarter than me. The shepherd is wiser and knows better than me. And I'm not going to let my arrogance get into the way of that. That I know in my heart, I'm giving the shepherd my heart. I'm giving him my life. I trust the shepherd. And when I follow the shepherd, he gives me all that I need. He don't give me some of what I need. He don't give me every once in a while, I'll give you a little nugget here and there. No, he gives me all that I need when I realize that I'm going to be passionate about following him. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to put my heart and my life into his hands. James says it like this in James chapter 4. Watch this. So then surrender to God. I'm going to surrender to God. I'm going to put my life in your hand. Watch what he goes on to say. Stand up to the devil and resist him, and he will turn and run away from you because he's a defeated coward. He ain't got no authority and no power in your life. He's already been defeated. And when we surrender to God, we tell him, you don't have a place in my life. So he goes and finds someone else to mess with because he realized you've left no room for him in your heart. It goes on to say, move your heart closer and closer to God. And he'll come even closer to you. But make sure you cleanse your life, you sinners, and keep your heart pure and stop doubting. Other translation says, don't divide your loyalty between God and this world. Do you see this? That as you move your heart closer to God, he comes closer to you. If you start saying, God, I don't want sin or any of this stuff to hinder me. I don't want none of this junk in my life, but I want you to cleanse me. And I'm not going to be divided, my Lord. I'm not going to sometimes crave the world and then sometimes when I'm at church crave you. No, I'm going to be solely committed to you and surrendering to you because it's in this place the devil flees. It's in this place he has to go somewhere else. It's in this place he realizes there ain't no more room in my heart for him because Jesus is taking its place. That's why you got to get this heart right, your passions right, your emotions right, your your heart and your alignment to be the person God created you to be. And that's why the writer in Proverbs says such a powerful statement when he says it like this. He says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Notice he says this. You got to guard this above anything else. And that's a powerful statement. And that's something a lot of times we will skim over very quickly. But what we don't realize is the validity to it. And here's what he's basically saying in in our terms, or maybe the way we can realize it a little bit more. He's basically saying this. I want you to write this in your notes. What gets your attention gets your heart. And that determines the course of your life. Like what's getting your focus? What's getting your attention? What do you crave? What do you dream about? What do you desire about everything else? Because that's getting your heart. And that's where you're going, whether you like it or not. And we live in a world today, man, it is literally vying for our attention every chance it can get. We are in stimulus overload. We're getting hit where we are desiring attention from everyone else and we're craving to fill. Everything else is getting our attention. We're craving it. We can't even be bored for two seconds, right? Why? Because we get attention at our fingertips, right? We get it, man, instantly. You can get that attention. You can get that validation for everything you want. And then you're also focusing on this. It's consuming you. And I don't know. I'm getting a little old, I guess. I'm getting a little, I got to be honest with y'all. I'm getting old. I'm not understanding social media like I used to back in the day when I was a young dude in ministry. Somebody the other day started saying 35 was old. I got offended by that. 35, still young. (laughs) Insulting me like that. I was in Florida this summer in Orlando with our family. 
And we went to Disney Springs and we're out at this outside theater waiting for a show to get ready to get started. And there's this girl in front of me sitting right in the, in the, in the aisle in front of me. She's got to be a young teenager, probably 14, 15, I don't know, something like that. So, you know, early and she's got her phone out and she's got, I'm assuming a social media app, but it's not anything I've ever done. So I don't know what it is. And it's like a list of messages or notifications or something. So I'm about to age myself. But she goes and she would click on a message and she'd take a picture of herself and then she'd click on another one and take a picture of herself and click on another one, take a picture of herself. And that sounds like, all right, well, that's no big deal. No, nah, you don't realize the way the girl was doing it. She was literally clicking on it, post, clicking on it, post, clicking on it, post. All these, she hit like 30 pictures in like five seconds. Like, I'm not joking. I'm sitting there and I'm a ball of emotions because I'm confused because I don't even know what she's doing. I'm impressed, because I can't even come up with 30 poses if I had 20 minutes to think about it. And I'm a little worried, like, girl, I don't even know what you're putting out to the world. And then I'm at the gym last week, and there's a girl sitting on a workout machine doing the exact same thing, not using the machine, taking pictures. So I guess I don't know what the youths are doing today, all right? I don't know. But it got me going, whoa, man, it's so much instant validation, so much getting our attention, so much we're craving to get the accepted attention. And it's not just in social media. We do this in lots of areas of our life, right? We want to get attention from others. We crave and something gets all our focus, our attention, whether that's in our, in our workplaces, in our careers, whether that's in our possessions or our money, whether that's being super mom or super dad whether that's our talents and, and what we're good at. And none of those things are inherently bad or wrong, right? There's nothing wrong with being successful in your job. There's nothing wrong with making a good living. There's nothing wrong with being a great parent. There's nothing wrong with being talented. The problem happens is when we crave the attention and validation from everyone else instead of the one person that we should crave our attention from. The problem happens when we think about those things and are consumed about those things and they take precedent and priority over God. And because what happens is, is, is those things get our attention because deep down inside we think there's what's going to fulfill us. They're going to complete us. There's what's the missing piece of our heart's longings. That's the, the plug that we got to put into the hole in our heart and we get consumed with everything outside of what really should get our attention. Here's what I know. And if you don't get this, it's a dangerous place to be in. Write this in your notes. Misplaced attention will lead to a false sense of happiness. All those things, they're going to temporarily crave that sweet tooth in your spirit. Getting those accolades, it'll crave it. Getting those likes online, they're going to crave it. Letting everybody think you are super mom, super dad, and they consume every ounce of your schedule where you don't have any time for anything else, it's going to consume it. Your money, your things, your possession, every once in a while it's going to satisfy it for a temporary. But it's never going to give you joy or fulfillment. Because the only one that does is your God. That's why Jesus says, what good is it to gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? And what he's saying is, what good is it to get attention or put your attention and focus on everything of this world and let it come before your God? Because then is anything more important than your God? Because it's only in those places where God becomes first and we give God our heart that life makes sense. And it's only in those places then your work and your money and your parenting and your gifts fall in alignment in a healthy way and they actually complete you instead of distract you. It's only when God is what you're passionate about. So I want to talk very quickly about how do we align our hearts? How do you align your hearts with God? How do you get connected in the person you're called and created to be? How do you walk in what you're supposed to walk in? And the very first thing is very simple, yet most people don't do it. Passionately pursue Jesus. Passionately pursue 
Jesus, listen to me. This thing ain't a religion. It's a relationship. This ain't some duty you check off on a list. I got to go to church. I got to go to this, this organization. I got to go to this building. I guess I got to read my book so I can do my book report. This is about a life-changing encounter with a God. This is about understanding your life will never make sense unless you're in a relationship with him. This is like I'm craving something bigger than myself. I long for my soul to connect with its created state. I long to have a God speak to me. I long to hear from God. I long to him to show me the plans. I'm going to passionately pursue him. I'm going to give him everything. Because here's what I know. Write this in your notes. The distance between you and what you love determines whether you have the capacity to allow something to separate you from what you love. That's a long statement, but I wanted you to hear it again. The distance between you and what you love determines whether you have the capacity to allow something to separate you from what you love. I want you to look at this from a personal standpoint. In my marriage, I've always found that when there's tension or there's discord or there's disunity, it's because there's a separation between me and my wife. It's because we're not connecting. We're not pursuing each other. We're not literally passionately trying to connect and grow. We're not dating each other. We're not making each other a priority because love equals pursuit. And the more you pursue, the more that love grows. So the more I pursue my wife, the more I love my wife, the more that distance between us now starts closing and I don't have the capacity to have negative thoughts or bitter thoughts or hurtful thoughts towards her. It's hard to divorce someone you pray with. It's hard to divorce someone you seek God with. It's hard to divorce someone you're passionately in love with because it's something I'm pursuing. The same is in your relationship with God. The more distant you are from God, the more there's a separation between you and God, the more negativity can get in between you and God and separate you. But love equals pursuit and love grows as you pursue more and as you pursue your God more and seek your God more more and are passionate about your God more, that space starts to shrink and nothing is separating for you from your God. That's why Jesus made this statement. If you love me, keep my commands. He's not making this statement saying you better prove to me you love me by obeying some rules. He's saying, if you love me, obeying is going to come natural. Because as you love me, that gap is going to get smaller, which means you're going to start walking more into your spiritually created design. And as a natural reflection, you're going to be living the life that God planned for you. But it's all about understanding love equals pursuit. And the more you pursue, that love grows. That's why First John says it like this. In fact, this is love for God to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. It's not an obligation. It's not awkward. It's not weird. Whoever has the son has life. And whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. That the more you understand and more you love, it becomes natural a part of who you are and what you want to do. So this is what I realize. Write this in your notes. Temptation or compromise doesn't expose our weakness and willpower, but the weakness in our relationship. When we're struggling and being consumed with a temptation and we get to that place where we keep sinning over and over again. And you know what I'm talking about when you sin over and over again and what happens? You get guilt and you tell God, God, I'm never going to do it again. I, I'm never going to do it. I'll be better. I'll be stronger next time. If you just forgive me one more time, I won't do it again. And we think the reason why we keep falling that temptation is because we don't have enough willpower. So I'm going to just muster up more strength. I'm going to be a little bit more stronger. I'm going to be a little bit more. I'm going to resist it a little bit more. It has nothing to do with willpower. It has everything to do is there's a gap in your relationship. And you've got to pursue your God more. 
Because in your weakness, he's made strong. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And he can't strengthen you unless you're seeking him. He can't be made strong in you unless you're pursuing him. And you got to understand that. So this is what you got to get in your spirit. Write this in your notes. Intimacy with God is what produces innocence in your life. It's only in the intimate relationship with God that you walk in who you were created to be and the purity of who God has called and created and equipped you to be. It's only through intimacy, not willpower, not man-made strength, not self-discipline that you keep scolding yourself with. It's in this discipline of pursuing your God that you understand the innocence that God has for you. And you walk in that. And you receive that. And as you read his word more, and as you pray more, and as you worship more, and as you surround yourself with life-giving people more, and as you go to church regularly, and you get in a life group and confess more, it's in those intimate encounters with your God you start becoming who you were created to be. It's not an instant thing. It's a process thing. Second Corinthians says it like this. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Do you see that? Not where the spirit of your self-discipline is. Not in the spirit of your willpower. In the spirit of the Lord. When you are pursuing him and having intimacy with him, that's where you discover freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and then we reflect the glory of God. So as we start pursuing him more and encountering him more, all of a sudden we start seeing his glory. Watch this. And we reflect it. And he, he, the Lord who is the spirit makes us more and more. See how this is a process, not instant. Every day you get a little bit more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. You will become changed as image because you're pursuing him and you have a relationship with him. Oh, so we're going to passionately pursue Jesus. Number two, write this in your notes. Obedience leads to a thriving relationship, not compliance. Obedience leads to a thriving relationship, not compliance. See, here's what happens a lot of times. We obey because we fear the consequences of not obeying. Instead of obeying because we realize we thrive when we walk in the design of God. So a lot of us will toe the line because we don't want to go to hell. That cannot be the motivation for your relationship. We want to walk in the commands of God because we want to live the life that God had planned for us. We want to thrive in that relationship. There's a different motivation there. That's why Jesus said in Matthew don't think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I'm not to come to abolish them, but fulfill them. You know what Jesus is saying here? I still care about morality. I still care about you being the righteous person God created you to be. I still care that you don't sin. So I'm not giving you permission just to sin and just let grace take care of it. What I'm telling you is I still want you to be who you were created to be, but I come to fulfill it. So every covenant in the Old Testament, every covenant in the New Testament, every plan and design I've had for you, I want you to walk in it. I want you to walk as the righteous disciples you're called to be. I want you to walk in the purpose you're created to be. I want you to walk with joy that cometh every morning. I want you to walk in peace beyond understanding. I want you to have a strength from the heavens. I want you to speak the words of God and I want mountains to move. I want chains to come off. I want freedom to be breathed in the hearts and minds of people. I want you to pray prayers and heaven come down. I want you to live it. So I want you to realize you're going to pursue righteousness. You're going to be the person God called and created you to be. And we got to get this in our spirit. And this is where repentance comes in. This is where we want to live a repentant life. This is where we want to remove sin in our life. And we want to get rid of it. We don't want to, we don't want to uh, uh, sa uh, not sacrifice. We don't want to have uh, compliance in our life where we're complying with the world. We want to walk in the freedom of who God is. Luke says it like this. Jesus said, if any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way and take up your cross daily and follow me. 
You see what he's saying here? You got to give up what you think is normal in this world. You got to die to yourself every single day and say, not my will, your will be done. And you got to follow me where I'm taking you. He says, if you try to hang on to your life, you lose it. So if you want to keep your compromises, you want to keep living in the gray area, you're going to miss something so much greater. But if you give up your life for my sake, you're going to save it. You're going to walk in something more. Notice what he says. Daily, you got to die. Watch what Jesus says in the daily prayer. Watch this. And forgive us of our sins as we've forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. This is the prayer Jesus said you got to pray every day, right? I'm going to get this in your spirit every day. And what he's trying to get you to understand is that repentance isn't just telling God you're sorry. Repentance is saying, God, I recognize something's wrong and I'm going to turn from it because I don't want that to be a part of my lifestyle anymore. I want to turn from it and follow you. I want to give that up. I want to die to myself and I want to follow you. And he tells you you need to do this every day. Why? Because you're naturally going to drift. You're naturally going to drift to complacency. You're naturally going to drift to compromise. You're going to naturally drift towards those sins. And if you're not recognizing it every day, later on down the road, you're going to realize that separation we talked about earlier is bigger than what you thought. It's why I call it the one degree of separation. It kind of looks like this. Purpose in life and health is this line. Time is in this line. If you get off one degree in separation, it don't look that big a deal, right? I'm not that far off my purpose. I'm not that far off of being healthy. No big deal. But watch what happens when time goes. Look, if you stay on that path for a certain amount of time, look at the gap now between you and your God. Look at that separation from your health and your purpose in life and where you are now. It's why every single day we say, God, search our hearts. Let me know if there's anything in my life I shouldn't be there. God, I'm sorry for the way I spoke. I'm sorry for what I I don't want that to define me anymore. I want to give you my heart. And I realize I'm not doing it to follow rules. I'm doing it because I want purpose and I want a thriving relationship with you. So we recognize we're going to passionately pursue Jesus. We recognize that purpose. Watch what it goes on to say. Number three, we're going to make the commitment to leave the past in the past. We're going to make the commitment to leave the past in the past. Watch what Jesus says in Luke. Anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. See that? Anyone that starts going down the path that God has for them, but then keeps looking back, man, I kind of want that old life. I kind of want those old compromises. I kind of want to keep. You're not going to walk in what God has for you. Paul says it like this. I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ just, Jesus first possessed me. I press on. No, dear brothers, I haven't reached perfection. I'm going to forget the past, looking forward to what lies behind. Here's what I found. A lot of people want to give God their life, but they still hang on to pieces of their past and they wonder why they're not thriving. They wonder why the devil keeps getting them. They wonder why they keep struggling. You can't be one foot in and one foot out. You can't say, Jesus, I'm giving you my whole life and then still be chained to your past. You can't be still chained to negative environments. Can't be still chained to negative activities. You can't still be chained to negative relationships because what's going to happen is every time you start going to the places God has for you, you're going to get that chain taught and it's going to jerk you backwards. And you can't get no progression in your life. And I did this for many years. I took a lot of past pains I experienced early in my life and I tried to bring it into my present. I brought it in my marriage. I brought it in the way I parented. I brought it into the way I led. And I kept finding myself doing a lot of harm and damage because I didn't leave the past in the past. I brought it in my present life. 
I brought the way I reacted to people in my present. I brought the way I treated people in my, and then I would justify it by saying, you know what, that's the way I was raised, or that's what happened to me, or that's how I was treated. No, I gotta understand, I'm a new creation. The old is gone. I'm not defined by my past. I'm not defined by my failures. I'm not defined by my pain. I'm defined by my freedom, seen through the lens of God's grace. And I'm leaving the past in the past. But that's a choice you got to make. I love the promise that God gives in Deuteronomy. Today I've given you the choice between life and death. You have that choice between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. God ain't going to force you. God ain't going to make you. God's going to let you choose. He goes on to say, oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God. See what that says? By obeying him. Remember that? We don't obey for compliance. We obey for relationship. And committing yourself firmly to him. I ain't going backwards. I'm moving forward. This is the key to your life. I'm going to passionately pursue Jesus. I'm going to live the life God has for me in righteousness. And I ain't going back. So this is the thought I want to leave with you. This is what I want you to get so deep in your spirit. Write this in your notes. Intimacy is a result of consistency. Remember, intimacy leads to innocence. But intimacy is developed when you're consistent with that relationship. When you give your heart to someone, that's a big deal, right? You don't just give your heart to anyone. You give your heart to someone you trust, someone you care about, someone you love. And as you get deeper in that relationship and you get more intimate in that relationship, the more freely you let go of your heart. That's the same it is with God. That the more you pursue God, the more you seek God, the more you let go and you surrender to him. Oh, that you would choose life. And listen to me very clearly. There's some people in this room right now that needs to choose life. You've been choosing death for too long. You've been choosing curses for too long. And it's time you choose the blessings. It's time you choose life. It's time you choose your God. And there's some people in this room right now have no relationship with your Jesus. Maybe you never have. Maybe you used to, but you've walked away and you know you're living a life that's not pleasing to God. But today's the day you choose life. Oh, that you would choose life and truly live. Well, Pastor Mike, how do you choose that life? It's really simple. The Bible says all you gotta do is with your mouth say, Jesus, I give you my life. I give you a life. Come be a part of my life. And then you just say, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me of all my mistakes, any sins I've made. Any time I've fallen short, forgive me. You just gotta say it. And then the Bible says you gotta believe in your heart that he hears your prayers. Why? Because he ain't rotting in a grave somewhere. He's the resurrected king sitting at the right hand of God. And when you pray, he hears it. When you pray, he responds. And when you pray, the Bible says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. They will be forgiven. You will be forgiven. The moment you speak it, you receive it. Just got to believe. And if you're in this room right now, I don't want you walking away from life. I want you choosing it and receiving it. So we're going to pray this prayer together as a family. I want everybody to bow your heads. Nobody looking around. And take your hand and place it over your heart. It's a symbol of your soul. And repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I believe you died on a cross. I believe you rose from the grave. And I believe your blood washes away all sins. Come be a part of my life. Today, I give you my life because I am forgiven. 
I am chosen and I matter. Holy Spirit, I pray right now, doubt is gone in the name of Jesus. Condemnation is gone in the name of Jesus. Mercy, grace, joy, peace, strength, and purpose is taking their place right now in the name of Jesus. They're standing up, surrendering their lives to you, and the devil has to flee in the name of Jesus. With every head battle and nobody looking around. If you made that commitment today for the first time, or you recommitted your life to Jesus, I'm going to ask you to do something very bold and very brave, and it is bold and it is brave. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in just a second. Now you may say, Pastor Mike, why do you want me to raise your hand? Because this is not something to be embarrassed about. This is something to be proud about. This is something to be excited about. This is something to tell that devil he ain't got no more place in your life. But you are a free child of God. And I want to rejoice with you. I want to celebrate with you. The Bible says heaven is rejoicing. There's a party in heaven. And I want to join that party today. So on the count of three, I want to see hands all over this place raised. One, don't be afraid. Two, we're going to celebrate Three, get your hands up right now. Say, Pastor Mike, today, I see your hand. Thank you, Jesus. And you see your hand right here. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Come on, church, get excited. Come on, you can do better than that. If one person, heaven rejoices, we got new family here tonight. Welcome to the family. Welcome home. And listen to me right now. You found Jesus, but you just getting started. There's freedom you're going to find. There's purpose you're going to find. And together, we can make a difference. And this church wants to be in your corner. There's nothing I want more than to see you bloom into everything you're created to be. But to do that, there's a process. There's a journey you're going to go on. And we want to go on this journey with you. Because you may accept a Jesus, but go into your head. Whether you raise your hand or not, it goes, Pastor Mike, what's next? Where do I go from here? Well, I want to help resource you with a few things. First off, I want to get a free gift in your hands. It's a book called Following Jesus, absolutely free, but it's going to answer some of those questions on what to do next. What are some of those, those foundational things about our faith you need to know about? And to get this book, whether you raised your hand or not, you should go right out these doors, the Welcome Center or the black t t uh, tent outside and just say, give me the book. Secondly, if you've just given your heart to Jesus, or maybe you've been saved for 20, 30 years, but you feel like there's no progression in your life. You feel like you're not growing. You, you feel like you got a lot of questions. You feel like you're doubting things. You, you just don't know what to do. It's just, you just kind of say, Pastor Mike, I don't know what's next. I'm gonna invite you to something we do every Sunday right in this room at 2 p.m. We have something called a discipleship Q&A. It is the perfect place to have great life-giving conversations with some phenomenal leaders who have one job, they want to see you grow and bloom into everything you're created to be. And that's what we want for you. Church, can we celebrate our new family members one more time? Come on! What's up, family? Man, I'm so excited that you just tuned in to one of the messages here at Bloom, and I hope it really blessed you. If you'd like to stay up with Bloom, you can follow us on all social media sites at Church Bloom. And if this was really a blessing to you, and you want to continue to support our ministry and love to donate, you can go to bloomhere.org slash give or text the five-digit number listed right here below. Guys, we are blessed. Hope you tune in next time. I pray God's peace.